Bonjour à tous. Donc aujourd'hui, on a un intro d'un nouveau chargé de recherche qui s'appelle André Nusser, qui a été recruté donc en... sur le concours 2023. Il est chargé de recherche CNRS et il a rejoint l'équipe Coati. Donc il va se présenter et nous dire ce sur quoi il travaille. Ok, uh, I'll speak English because <laughs> yeah. it's easier for a talk for me. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody to my to my talk. Uh, it's about algorithm slow bounds and algorithm engineering. And in general, I will just give an overview uh, of what I'm what I'm doing, just that people know what I'm doing. But first, who who am I? What's my academic background? I did my master's at University of Stuttgart, then did an uh, internship at Apple in Sunnyvale to move on to a PhD at Max Planck Institute for Informatics supervised by Karl Bringmann, and then I did a two-year postdoc at the University of Copenhagen before coming here. And here you can see some of the main conferences and also PC memberships just to get an idea which community I kind of belong to. Uh, good, so that was just a little bit about me. Now, what areas am I working in? In general, my research, uh, so I try to aim to be to do algorithm theory, really, yeah, theory, theory but also then uh, do a little bit of applications and algorithm engineering in between. So what am I doing in algorithm theory? I do classical uh, algorithm design, as every one of us, I guess, saw in our undergrads. Uh, but I also do fine-grained lower bounds, and these fine-grained lower bounds are essentially something like NP-hardness just in the polynomial time regime, which are then based on assumptions uh, similar to P not equal to NP in the, uh, yeah, in the exponential time regime. Uh, I also do algorithm engineering, and this is kind of the cyclic process of uh, obtaining practically fast algorithms, where one first models a problem, then designs an algorithm, anal analyzes it, does an implementation, and then experiments, and then does this cyclically. So essentially, one tries to yeah, get a fast algorithm on practical benchmark data for a quite clearly mathematically defined problem. And this I do in geometry, but also on, on graphs. And application-wise, I did a little bit on animal trajectories. These are pigeon trajectories, trying to cluster them to understand their behavior, to understand their roots. But of course, then the interpretation has to be done by biologists and not myself. Good. So that was just a rough overview of uh, what, what areas I'm working in, uh, but what topics am I actually working on? What concrete topics? And there I want to talk about three different broad topics uh, today. First, sequence similarity. Uh, second, clustering, and third, polygon decomposition. And now I will go through all three of these and give some examples of my of my work. And I'm also working on more. Uh, I'm, I would say, generally broadly interested. Uh, so, but this is just an example. These are just some examples. Now, let me talk about sequence similarity. Uh, what are sequences? When I when I talk about it, I mean geometric sequences, and these are sequences of points that are embedded in some uh, geometric space, and uh, they they occur everywhere. For example, these are pigeon trajectories, but then also when humans move through through transportation networks, or uh, in in sports analysis, or also if you draw characters on a on a tablet. Uh, but one, one important thing that I want to note is that also audio data is just a sequence and can also be considered a, as a one-dimensional geometric sequence. So I'm also interested in, in this kind of data or also seismic data. Now, if we want to measure the similarity between sequences, because this is one of the core operations that one wants to do when considering sequences, uh, then there are different measures because there's not one uh, na most natural measure. And two of the most popular are the Frechet distance and dynamic time warping. And I'm going to consider uh, Frechet distance in the remainder uh, of this talk when it comes to sequence similarity measures. Why the Frechet distance? Because it's a very popular measure, I would say the most popular measure in computational uh, geometry. Good. Uh, now, uh, the Frechet distance, I just want to give the definition because I think that's actually very nice to know and it's not, uh, not very difficult to understand. So that also people can learn a little bit. Um, normally it's explained by a human and a dog and they walk along their respective trajectories. Uh, the human along the top one, the dog along the bottom one, and they are connected by a leash, which is an orange here. And one important uh, restriction is that they are only allowed to, to walk forward. So, for example, they can uh, walk forward like this, and then maybe the human 
uh, stays at its position uh, while, or the dog stays at its position while the human walks forward. And now the human, for example, stays at its position while the dog walks forward. And like this, they walk until the end. Now, um, so what we're interested in is the maximum distance that they have during this, what we call traversal, um, in, in this way of walking forward, because this is the leash length the minimum leash length that they need to actually do this traversal. And then if we minimize over all traversals, so over all ways of walking forward, then this is exactly the Frechet distance. So the Frechet distance is nothing else than the minimum required leash length for the human and the dog to traverse their trajectories jointly when they're only allowed to walk forward, but they can choose how they walk. Okay, this just, uh, yeah, to, to teach a little bit. Um, what I did, uh, that was actually still during my PhD, I did algorithm engineering on the Frechet distance. And here you can see some times, uh, you don't have to understand any, everything, but uh, the important thing is just that the, these, three, um, these three entries here, these are the top three out of 28 teams from the Six Spatial GIS Cup. That was a competition where people should get fast implementations for the Frechet distance. And at the bottom, you can see our, our implementation. You can see that in these experiments, we're up to 30 times faster. And the longer the curves get, the more, the higher our advantage actually gets. Um, so yeah, how did we, how did we get this, the speed up? Ah, but first one, one more note. I'm actually currently working together with Geometry Factory on integrating, uh, this code into Seagull finally, such that it becomes more broadly available. <laughs> now, how did we, uh, how did we get the speed up? Normally, when computing the Frechet distance, one computes something uh, which is called the free space diagram. This is the classical quadratic time algorithm. And there, one kind of partitions the space in uh, free and non-free. And the green part is free, the red is non-free. And then one wants to walk from the bottom left corner to the top right corner only on green space uh, and only walking up or right. Okay, so, but we want to avoid uh, creating this quadratically sized uh, object. So we came up with a divide and conquer algorithm where we then smartly pruned away certain parts of the, of the space. And here this blue space, you can think of that this is reachable from the bottom left corner. So with our rules in the end, what we have to compute for this example are only these, these small parts here. So instead of computing this quadratically sized object, we have to compute significantly, significantly less to realize that the Frechet distance is smaller than the threshold distance. So you cannot understand everything here from this example, but this is just to show like my general algorithm engineering approach. So still computing the same thing, but doing it significantly faster using some smart pruning rules, relying on, on structure in the underlying data. Now, I also worked on more theoretical topics when it comes to sequences, for example, the Frechet distance under, under translation. And there, uh, the Frechet distance under translation is defined as follows. Now we want to find a translation such that we shift these two curves uh, over each other as to minimize the, the Frechet distance. So we want to kind of find the best translational alignment. And all the algorithms computing this measure, uh, so this is, by the way, the discrete Frechet distance, but this is a minor detail just for the people who, who actually know the difference uh, to not confuse them. Um, yeah, so all the algorithms uh, computing this measure actually construct this, this arrangement, an arrangement of disks, and then essentially each cell in this arrangement corresponds to a discrete free space diagram. And if we then just go to a neighboring cell, then one vertex is being turned on and off, uh, on or off. Uh, yeah, so this is how this arrangement looks like. And then we can compute the Frechet distance under translation with an n to the six algorithm because this arrangement has size n to the four. And this uh, free space diagram, as I said before, is a quadratically sized object. And we, so we can construct it and then we get to n to the six. And if now one wants to improve this algorithm, one natural way would be to, to try to improve this n to the four. But actually in our work, we show that essentially this arrangement is necessary. So we actually have to compute this n to the four object uh, under the strong exponential time hypothesis. And the strong exponential time hypothesis is one of these hypotheses in fine grained complexity, which is kind of equivalent to, I mean, uh, analogous to p not equal to np uh, yeah, in the, in the non-polynomial time regime. Good, uh, so we have to improve this n squared bound and there, uh, yeah, there was already an offline algorithm. This means just we construct it naively. Then because we have this, uh, if we just move one, one cell 
then mm -hmm. only one vertex gets activated or deactivated. We can use an online algorithm. This was also already done. And we then use an offline dynamic algorithm, which is essentially we, we consider all of the updates already beforehand, and then we batch them together to, to obtain a faster, a faster algorithm. So again, this was just a broad idea to, uh, to give you, especially we have a geometric problem here, and then we used dynamic graph algorithms to actually solve it faster. And so it, it's really powerful to, to be knowledgeable in both of these domains to get faster algorithms. Now, uh, good. So the, the remaining topics I will touch a little bit more briefly. So let me talk a bit about clustering. And of course, if I, because I worked on sequence similarity measures, uh, it makes a lot of sense to also consider clustering <clears throat> under sequence similarity measures. And here you can see the output, output of our algorithm. And this is a so-called center-based clustering, meaning that our clustering is defined by some center, normally, I, I mean, if it's points, then it would be center points, but here it's like these center sequences. And essentially, we assign all of these thin sequences here to its closest fat center sequence. So the main difficulty comes from how, from computing these center sequences here. How do we actually compute them? And there in our paper, we presented an approach that if we have several curves or, or sequences, um, then and we already have a center curve, then kind of we use the Frechet distance because it gives us an alignment, as we saw before in the definition. We use this uh, alignment to then um, take minimum and closing balls of where things are matched to, to then uh, obtain a new center. Again, this is going over it very, very quickly, but just that you get some intuition of what the core uh, difficulty or core idea of this work of this work is good. And uh, I didn't only work on uh, on clustering of curves, but also on clustering of points, uh, more specifically on the k min sum radius problem. And there we are given a, a set of points. And we want to cover them with k disks, such that the sum of radii is minimized. So this is somewhat that has some similarity with the k-center problem, where we want to cover a uh, points at minimizing the maximum radius, and you can see why one might want to choose k min sum radius because on this example, k min sum radius actually gives a much better clustering. Now, uh, what is known about these two different clustering notions? Well, k min sum radius is actually a poly in po polynomial time solvable, but it n to the 881, uh, while while k center is is np hard. And, but for k equals two, there was only a near quadratic time algorithm known, which is uh, older than 30 years already. And while for k center, there is a near linear time algorithm, which is optimal. Now, uh, what we did in our work is we uh, brought this uh, over 30 year old algorithm, near quadratic time algorithm down to near, near linear time. I'm omitting log factors here for simplicity. And we showed actually that one can solve the three min sum radius problem. So with one cluster more in the same time as one could before solve the two min sum radius problem. Uh, but what, what is maybe even more important about, about these results is that we actually gained some structural insights how the clusters are separated. So we understood more about, about the structure of the problem because of course the goal in the end is to improve this N to the 881 and bring it down to something a little bit more reasonable. Good. Uh, so uh, now the rest of the time I have for polygon decomposition problems. Uh, there I'm again talking about two different topics. Uh, polygon decomposition is a problem where we are given a polygon and we want to decompose it into specific types of pieces. So for example, here we would decompose it into, into convex pieces. And this is, a, um, this is a partitioning problem, but we might also consider a covering problem where the pieces are allowed to, to overlap and we just want to cover the whole polygon such that the union of the pieces is the, exactly the polygon. And there I want to briefly talk about two problems. First about the star partition problem where we want to partition a polygon into, uh, into star polygons. These are just polygons where we have a point that sees the whole interior of the polygon. So they are kind of visibility polygons. And I will talk briefly about convex cover where we want to cover a polygon with convex pieces. Now for the star partition problem, uh, one, one interesting thing or why this is interesting is because the star cover problem, so covering a polygon with uh, star-shaped pieces is just the art gallery problem. 
and that we know is NP hard or even existential of the reals hard. So uh, for over 40 years, it was not clear whether the partition version of the art gallery problem is actually a polynomial time solvable or if it's NP hard or, or something else. And yeah, so we give a polynomial time algorithm. This is at this year's stock. And, uh, but the running time is entered the 107. So it's not, a, not at all a practical algorithm, but at least we now know it's in P and hopefully we can move a little bit further than from, from there on. Um, good, and the algorithm is a dynamic program, but it's too complicated to, to explain here. Good, so the last uh, topic that I'm going to talk about is the convex cover problem. So where we want to cover a polygon with convex pieces. And there I just briefly want to give an algorithm sketch. And this again was a competition. So this was one should, this was the problem of getting a fast implementation to, to solve this problem. Uh, because SOCG, uh, the, the, the most important computational geometry conference, has this, uh, this competition where one should solve problems uh, or find the best solutions for, for hard problems. Our algorithm worked as follows. We took the input, then we first computed a convex partition, so a partition, not a, not a cover first, <laughs> because this is easier to compute also for convex, for the convex case. Then we computed the visibility graph on, on this convex partition, meaning that all the pieces are vertices while they have an edge when they fully see each other. So when each pair of points in these pieces can see each other. And now on this, again, we have a graph. On this, we now compute a clique cover. So we want to cover the graph with cliques. And from this, we can reconstruct a, a solution for the convex cover problem. We have some repairs that omit it because this is not entirely correct but this is uh, too much for this talk now. But again, we have this geometric problem, we reduce it to a graph problem, solve the graph problem, and then lift it to the, to the geometric problem. So this is a very common theme in, in my work. And with that, I just want to show one last beautiful picture. This is one of the still smaller instances of the, of the competition where we had this uh, convex covering problem. And yeah, that is that. Thanks. <laughs>